Hi, I'm Brenton, one of our MCAT tutors here at Inspira Advantage, where we help students get into med school and other professional programs. The digestive process begins in the mouth, where food is mechanically broken down by the teeth and chemically broken down by enzymes in saliva, such as salivary amylase. Salivary amylase breaks down carbohydrates. The chewed and partially digested food, called a bolus, then starts moving down the esophagus and into the stomach through a series of muscular contractions called peristalsis. Once in the stomach, stomach acid and enzymes continue to break down the food, forming a liquid mixture called chyme. Hydrochloric acid, or HCl, is secreted by parietal cells in the stomach, which creates an acidic environment that kills bacteria and activates enzymes called pepsin. Pepsin then breaks down proteins. The stomach also acts as a storage organ, holding onto the chyme until it's ready to be released into the small intestines. Gastrin, secretion, and cholecystokinin, CCK, are the hormones that regulate the release of stomach acid and enzymes. In a later video, we will explore these hormones in greater depth. For now, just focus on the pathway as a whole. After leaving the stomach, we're going to pass into the small intestine. Small intestine is broken into three parts. First, the duodenum, shown here in orange, leading directly from the stomach. The small intestine is the main site of nutrient absorption in the digestive system. It's a long, narrow tube that is about six meters long and is divided into three regions. We have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine, and it is directly where food will move to after passing through the stomach. The duodenum is about 25 centimeters long, and it receives secretions from the pancreas and the liver via the pancreatic duct, also the common bile duct. These secretions contain enzymes that aid in the breakdown of food. The duodenum also receives chyme from the stomach from the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter is the sphincter between the stomach and the duodenum. The role of the pyloric sphincter is just to prevent food from moving down into the duodenum before it's marinated in the hydrochloric acid long enough. After passing through the duodenum, the food will then move into the jejunum, shown here in red. The jejunum is the middle section of the small intestine, and it's about 2.5 meters long and it is responsible for the majority of nutrient absorption. The walls of the jejunum are lined with villi and microvilli, which increase the surface area for absorption. The jejunum also receives secretions from the pancreas and liver, which aid in digestion. After moving through the jejunum, we are then going to move into the ileum, the final part of the small intestines. It is about 3.5 meters long and continues to absorb nutrients. It also absorbs vitamin B12 and bile acids. The ileum connects to the large intestine via the ileocecal valve. The big takeaways for the small intestine are that this is where the majority of nutrient absorption occurs. Now we're done with the small intestine and are going to begin talking about the large intestine. After passing through the small intestine, indigestible material moves into the large intestines. The large intestine, also known as the colon, is the final segment of the digestive tract. It is divided into several regions, including the cecum, including the cecum, colon, rectum, and anus. The cecum is the first part of the large intestines. It's attached to the appendix, which you can see dangling off here. It is a pouch-like structure that receives material from the small intestine via the ileocecal valve. The appendix, the small finger-like protrusion, is located in the cecum. The colon is the longest part of the large intestine and is divided into four regions. The ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoidal colon. The sigmoidal colon is shaped like an S and is right before the rectum. The ascending colon is a continuation of the cecum and it runs upward on the right side of the abdomen. The transverse colon then runs horizontally across the upper abdomen and the descending colon runs downward on the left side of the abdomen. The sigmoid colon is where we end here and it is S shaped. Finally, the rectum is the last segment of the large intestine and it connects the colon to the anus. The rectum is a short straight tube that is about 12 centimeters long. It stores feces before they are eliminated through the anus. The anus is the final opening of the digestive tract, and it is surrounded by two sphincter muscles. We have the internal and external sphincters, which help, which help control the elimination of feces. The large intestines have several important functions. The main ones being it absorbs water and electrolytes from the indigestible material. The second big part is it forms feces. It has a diverse population of bacteria, which play a role in the fermentation of undigested carbohydrates. 
The large intestine also receives secretions from the liver, which contain bile that help emulsify fats and make them easier to be absorbed by the body. Overall, the digestive system is a complex and intricately regulated process that involves multiple organs and hormones working together to break down food and absorb nutrients. Understanding the different structures and functions of the digestive organs, as well as these hormones and enzymes involved in the processes, are very important to the MCAT. So stick around to our next video where we explore the function of the enzymes. Thank you so much for watching our video on the anatomy of the digestive system, and I'll see you next time.